Hey there, kids, it's me, Mr. Creepypasta. And before we get on to tonight's story by Vincent Vinicava, I want to tell you about a book that Vincent Vinicava is going to be in, or is in. It came out earlier this month. But if you guys are looking for horror stories by some of the greatest minds in horror, Vincent Vinicava is just one of the few that I want to include there. But also, guys like Clive Barker and Graham Masterson. You should definitely check out Dark Places, Evil Faces, Volume 2. It's another charity anthology, just like we were promoting last year, and it goes towards the charity Rethink Mental Illness. You could buy the book by going to the link in the description down below, and everything that you guys spend on that book is going to be helping out charity. So get some spooks from some great authors, and do some good. Okay, sorry for the quick cutaway, but happy Halloween, folks. And... On to tonight's story. <laughs> Kelly's eyes snapped open and for a moment she wasn't sure why. She had been asleep and dreaming about something, but try as she might she couldn't remember what it was. It must have been terrible. That much she knew. She could feel dim pangs of dread still surging through her body, an echo of whatever grotesque horror her unconscious mind had conjured up. It must have been a nightmare, she reasoned. It had been a noise, a knocking sound, but that was all she could recall. How could something as simple as a knock leave her with such an appalling feeling of doom? She wondered why nightmares vanish upon awakening, from one second to the next, leaving only traces of their wicked selves behind then decided that whatever the reason, it was probably a blessing. Kelly sat up and rubbed her eyes. She had fallen asleep on the couch while watching a movie, Wes Craven's Scream, a film she had taken in every Halloween since she was a kid. It was her own special way of celebrating the holiday. She glanced up at the screen and saw the credits were rolling. How far in had she gotten? Ten, maybe fifteen minutes before nodding off? But didn't matter. She might not remember her dreams, but she had every scene of that movie memorized frame for frame, from Casey Becker's infamous phone call to the orange dawn breaking over the sleepy, blood-soaked town of Woodsboro. It was then that she noticed something wet at her feet, and when Kelly glanced down to see what she felt, her breath left her body. It was a deep red puddle pooling on the floor, and for a few uneasy seconds, she believed that she had never woken from her nightmare. That dread which had never truly left her began to increase in intensity once more, pulsating its way through her body in sickening, inky waves. Was she bleeding? She, she couldn't be sure. Why did it seem like her drowsy mind was taking so long to return to the waking world? It wasn't until she noticed the wine glass on the ground that she realized that it wasn't blood on the floor. The Cabernet that she'd been drinking before she fell asleep. She cursed her nerves and stood up, then cursed herself again for spilling a full glass of red wine on her hardwood floor. The holiday was getting to her. She thought that maybe she should have broken from her tradition and gone to the costume party her friends had invited her to. At least then she wouldn't be alone. But Halloween had fallen on a Wednesday this year, and she had to go into work early in the morning for a meeting. She glanced at the clock. It was a quarter past ten. She figured that she'd get some sleep just as soon as she cleaned up the mess. And then came the knock at the door. Knock, knock, knock. Slow and deliberate. Just like her nightmare. Maybe she hadn't dreamed it. Maybe the knocking had simply invaded her sleeping mind. It couldn't have been trick-or-treaters, not at that hour. Was it her girlfriend, coming with a late-night makeshift costume in an effort to drag her out to the party? Kelly checked her phone, but she saw that she had received no messages, and it wasn't like her friends to show up unannounced. Who is it? she meant to say, but her mouth wouldn't form the words. All that escaped her lips was a low, guttural groan. Why did the knocking unnerve her so? Slowly she approached the door, heart beating like a drum inside her chest. She kept the chain lock fastened so the door would open only a little and peered out into the darkness. There was no one outside. Kelly took a deep breath, opened the door all the way, and then stepped out into the night. 
She scanned the front yard, looking for any sign of whoever had just been at her door, but aside from a few lights glimmering in windows of the neighboring houses, her street was asleep. It must have been some dumbass teenager, she thought to herself, playing a game of Ding Dong Ditch, because her parents let them stay out late on Halloween. She let herself back into the house, locking the door behind her, then started for the kitchen to grab some paper towels. That wine was going to stain the floorboards. She was certain of it. Didn't lemon juice help with wine stains, or was it detergent? She'd need to consult Google in the morning. The knock came again. Only it was more of a pounding this time, as though someone was trying to beat down her front door with a sledgehammer. It rattled the walls of the house, and Kelly could feel it vibrating through her bones as well. A scream rose in her throat, but she swallowed it back down. She tried to rationalize what was happening. Some idiot kids, out past their curfew, were messing with her. She probably even knew who they were, too. They probably lived in the same neighborhood. The Peters kids, or the, the Burke twins, who she had heard were always getting into trouble at school. Either that or she was still asleep. Asleep and dreaming about something horrible waiting just beyond the door. No, that, that couldn't be the case. She was awake, very much so, and yet some part of her didn't want to confirm this. Kelly grabbed the baseball bat from her coat closet and then approached the door. She waited for a minute to see if someone would knock again. If so, she thought she might jerk the door open and catch whoever's punk was messing with her off guard, raise the bat up and threaten to call the cops or, or the kid's parents, whoever she thought might scare the little brats more. She waited for what seemed like forever, and, and when she decided she couldn't wait any longer, she swung the door open and readied the Louisville slugger, as if she was Barry Bonds getting ready to belt a 600-foot moonshot to McCovey Cove. But once more... Kelly found herself all alone, staring out blankly into the empty autumn night. Again, the street was quiet. Again, she wondered if she was sleepwalking through some terrible dream. She was about to head back inside when she noticed what was sitting at her doorstep. It was a cat. Or rather, the corpse of a cat that had been stomped on and mangled by some sick bastard. The animal's tail had been removed with shears, and entrails stretched halfway down the front steps as if it was trying to escape from the gash that had been opened in the feline's abdomen. The cat had an awful odor about it, some sickening cocktail of ash and rot, and maybe cat shit too. It was a stray, at least that's what Kelly reasoned, looking at its matted, patchy fur and lack of collar. Its eyes were closed, which she was thankful for. She thought they might burn some hideous image into her mind if she looked into them, but there was still something terrible about the poor cat's face that she couldn't help but observe. A frozen look of terror, as if, as if the animal was stuck in some everlasting nightmare. She considered calling the police, but eventually decided against it. What could they do with zero leads? Were they really going to waste time and resources investigating this disgusting prank? On Halloween night, she assumed the cops were flooded with calls, and she could already hear the passive-aggressive tone in the 911 operator's voice as he explained to her that the line needed to remain open for real emergencies. Just some dumbass kids, she thought. Some weird, fucked-up, dumbass kids. Kelly bagged the mangled feline, doing her best not to touch it with her hands, and then tossed it in the garbage bin in front of her house. The trash collector was scheduled to come tomorrow, and the cat would be the city dumps problem then. At least the kitty's corpse would be gone by the time she woke up in the morning, and she wouldn't need to worry about its awful stench permeating from the trash can in front of her home. She headed back inside to check the time. It wasn't quite 10.30, in fact, it had only been 12 minutes since she had woken up on the couch, and yet she felt as if a lifetime had passed. She thought she remembered hearing something about time working differently in dreams, but if she had, it was only in passing. She never read any of Young's work. She preferred the fanciful worlds of Rowling and Radaran to the tedious, long-winded, psychological babble of long-dead quacks. Kelly showered off the last bit of the dead cat stink that had managed to cling to her, brushed her teeth, changed into her PJs, then slid under her bedsheets. She shifted around under the covers, trying to get comfortable, hoping that she may be able to fall asleep before the sun shines in November for the first time that year. 
and it was here that she felt something alien in bed with her. It was soft and warm. It felt damp against her legs, and for a second time that night, she caught a whiff of that terrible odor. Dread was once again pumping through her. It was in her blood. It flowed through her muscles, causing them to con constrict, tightening themselves against her will. She was hyperventilating or, or not breathing at all. She didn't know. This was a nightmare, wasn't it? She found herself outside of her bed, grabbing hold of the sheets. She didn't want to pull them off. She didn't want to see what she believed had been hiding under the covers, but she also knew she had no choice. Dread was in control now. It had taken over her body like a, like a mind-sucking parasite from an old sci-fi movie. She threw back the sheets to reveal the corpse of another cat in her bed. This one more mangled and grotesque than the last. This one smelling far worse. And then the knocking came. But not from the front door or some forgotten dream. This time it came from inside her bedroom closet. Knock. 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 Kelly screamed. She let out a cry so loud that it made her own ears ring. She wished she could run, but she felt paralyzed. The dread flowing through her body could not let her leave. She had become a prisoner to her own horror. Slowly, the door creaked open. She thought that she must be dreaming. Yes, that was the only answer that made sense anymore. The knocking, the cats, the thing inside the closet, they were all creations of her unconscious mind. She'd fallen asleep on the couch watching a scary movie and had never actually woken from her nightmare. She laid back on the bed, her feet tangled in the cat, and began to laugh hysterically as the closet opened wider. The hand was the first thing to appear. Snow White, with long spindly fingers and brown nails, it contrasted so brightly against the shadows of her bedroom, now she saw the smile. Red and wide, stretching across a bony white face much further than any normal grin should. It jerked as it moved, like a marionette puppet with no strings. It laughed with its eyes so yellow and jaundiced that they practically glowed in the darkness. What disturbed Kelly the most was the clothes it wore, a filthy stained sweatshirt and black pants. She would have almost preferred the thing had gone naked. Why does it feel the need to dress itself, she wondered. Though it walked on two feet, in her mind it was no more human than the cats that it had been torturing. There was not a shred of humanity left inside the thing in her bedroom, and it, it took no more than a passing glance to recognize that. A sudden stench filled her nostrils as she realized it hadn't come from the cat at all. No, the foul odor had been emanating from the porcelain devil all along. It twirled a bowie knife in its hands, and she knew it meant to cut her with it. She was dreaming. She had to be. She was dreaming this thing. It, it's... The bushy black mane and bright yellow eyes, its long, gaunt frame, and its gag-inducing stink. She started to laugh. It was all too ridiculous. It crawled up the bed like a spider, knife between a set of unnaturally white teeth. Why, it's, why are its teeth so white, she thought. Its nails are brown, its eyes look sick, but its teeth white like, like polished ivory slithered up her legs, belly dragging over the gutted cat's corpse, and she could make out more of its awful features. It didn't seem to have a nose or eyelids or lips, but it had carved an absurd smile into its face. Makeup, she thought. Her laughter had ceased. She didn't find her situation funny anymore. She found the thing in her bed ghastly, monstrous, and inhuman. Wake up, she thought again. I don't want to look at it anymore. Wake up, wake up, wake up pointy chin was resting on her chest now, and she could feel its warm breath against her face. Why couldn't she wake up? She was dreaming. She had to be. It lifted itself, straddling her hips, then slid the knife from its mouth. A moment later, and the point of the blade was against her throat. Wake, wake up, she shouted. She needed out of the nightmare, and she needed out now. Wake up, wake up, wake up. Tears began to trickle down Kelly's cheeks. And it wasn't until she heard its voice, low and croaky as if it were oozing from a cancer-stricken throat, that she was finally sure she was already awake. Go to sleep. The blade began to enter the front of Kelly's neck. She wasn't having a dream. All of this was happening. The pain she was feeling was very real, and this man-thing, this hideous nightmare, really did exist. Yes, Kelly was awake. But at least, she wouldn't be awake for much longer. <laughs>